Hey, Father. I'm doing well. How about you? Okay, great. We're closing it out. Perfect. Okay, call back later. <laughs> We're hopping back into the story of Moses, part three. Welcome to another episode of Bible Historias con Brianda. Brianda. And joining me. I don't know what she said, <laughs> but I know Comey's Weezy. with. So I think she meant to say Biblica, Bibliotheca. No, that mama, it? la Biblia. What Historias de la Biblia con Brianda. King. <laughs> Bilingual mommy. Hey. No, guys, I am not in a gang. I'm not affiliated with any gangs. I'm not blood. Oh, my God. Did I just? Oh, do I have any blood gang members listening? Hi, we welcome you. We love you. We uh, love everybody. We do love everybody. We'll take the blue ones. We'll take the yellow ones. We'll take it all. We'll take it all, honey. And we love you. Jesus loves you regardless. Oh, aren't um, you sweet? Violence is never good. Stay away from drugs unless okay. it's psilocybin mushrooms. Um. Anyways, let's hop into the story. Hold on. Wait, you guys. Another thing is if you see me throughout this episode, like winking or like. I don't know. You see like a weird like. Oh. Don't tell them about your fault. <laughs> I know. I, ju I just have to like. I I, I would want to know if I was a pod listener and I was watching on YouTube and I was like, what is up with my girl twitching? They it's can't see it. Oh, they can't? No. OK, well, whatever. Zoom in. Zoom in. Still can't see it. OK. Well, anyways, regardless, I'm going through some medical issues and it was either this or a, pi a pirate patch where I didn't wear my contact lenses. But I didn't do that because I wanted to look fab. So I put my contact in. I put my makeup on. I OK. Well, OK. They don't know what I'm experiencing. You guys, I get stressed eyes and stress hives, but I have a sty in my eye and that's why. But you can't see. I don't even know why I can set it. I may cut that. Who cares? Um, I may not cut that actually. I really do have a sty, and no, I we love the authenticity. Then we love they the too get styes. Oh, this is true. They do get styes. Anyone who knows who gets styes knows how painful it is, how annoying it is. You can't wear contact lenses, and like I literally read on the show fifty percent of the time. Like I can't not have my contacts in. Mm, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus? Jesus would have worn the pirate eye. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> could you could you imagine if I would have came in with a pirate eye? I would have no. made it sexy too. No, I'm so glad you didn't. Can we just get to Leviticus? <laughs> yes. All right, guys. This is the. Did you say get to Leviticus? I said let's get to Leviticus. <laughs> this is Exodus, bitch. <laughs> oh, I thought you said it was Leviticus. We're doing Leviticus next week. All right, whatever, girl. <laughs> oh God, Leviticus, you guys, stay tuned for that one because that will be a doozy. Ooh, a lot of biblical laws that have us beefing with Christians, and I'm mm, over you here know I like, like to break them. Oh, <sighs> strike me. No, don't. Oh, my gosh. Anyways, back to the story, guys. We are closing out the story of Moses is found in Exodus, uh, the book of Exodus. Today, we're going to be dealing with chapters 20 to the end. So chapters 20 to uh, chapter 40. I won't be going into too much depth on some parts of the book, but I encourage you all once again, like, this is not a Bible study. This is entertainment from a Christian girl and a beautiful wig, okay? And I really encourage you guys to read the book yourself. The book of Exodus is flashy. It's exciting. It's 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 worth reading. So definitely encourage you to read. But now let's recap where we left off in last week's episode. So last week's episode, we left off with... Ta-da! God has arrived. He has made his presence known at Mount Sinai. While everyone is at the floor of Mount Sinai, you hear thunder and trumpets blasting and people start to get fearful. You know what I'm saying? But of course, Moses has prepped the people. Moses, you know, remember they were consecrated. They weren't allowed to uh, have sex and stuff. They had to be, quote unquote, clean for when God were to come. And here he is. So God, no, well, everyone is so fearful. It's kind of funny. Uh, hi, TNG. It makes me think about how we instinctively fear what we don't know. And they knew that that was God. And so a lot of the Israelites were scared. They were even scared to look up let alone think about going up to the mountain, okay? A lot of them were not worthy of that luxury. 
Um, but anyways, Moses, Captain Moses, you know what I'm saying? He goes up to the mountain and sees God. I mean, his being, right? Not in, in incarnate. It was this the presence of God. He was right there. And, oh, wow. In that moment, God is about to share with Moses some of the most significant pieces of uh, biblical writing, and that is the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Words, as some people call it, and we all know what the Ten Commandments are. We've heard of it. We may not know all of them, but we've definitely heard of it. This is where Moses receives it. Now, what a lot of people get mistaken is they uh, say that Moses wrote the Ten Commandments down on, on, you know, the stone tablets and stuff that we always see on photos. We always see that animated, like this old bearded dude with a staff and like two tablets holding two uh, um, stone tablets. But what actually occurred was God wrote the tablets with his finger. And that is just in the text, honey. Okay. So these commandments were written by God. Now, Moses, and just for future, and th if you want to go back to part one and part two, this whole time, Moses has been a mediator for the people. He was not God, nor could he ever be God. He was a human. He was a shepherd. He was of the uh, Levitican line. He was a Levite uh, of the 12 tribes. That means that he was in the priesthood. So he was merely a mediator for the holy God and the sinful Israelites. So now we're going to get to some exciting stuff, Weezy. We're going to finally talk about what the Ten Commandments were. Greed, lying, murder, cheating on your wife uh, and your neighbor. Yeah, yeah, yes, no. I'm going to make stuff. it uh, short. Yeah, uh, wait for Leviticus for butt stuff. But I made this list like kid friendly. Because I could have used. Oh, okay. You know, from, you know what I'm saying, so, baby? would you like me to leave the room now? <laughs> no, I think it's just. Listen, I love the kids' Bible, kids' stories. I was an adult when I was learning about the Bible, okay? And those Bible animations on YouTube came in clutch. Like, they were still true, they were still truthful. They just, you know, simp oh, simplify things for a kid's brain, which sometimes adults need, need if we're being honest. So, the Ten Commandments. Commandments simplified were uh, uh, the first one, put God first, always. Second, no fake gods, no worshiping other gods, other idols. Third, respect God's name. You know, that means like not using the Lord's name in vain, which is a personal one that I struggle with. I say OMG all the time. And oh my goodness, is that it's, it, I mean, even then, it's still like, Ugh, you're replacing the How goodness. How is it bad? I felt like the bad one was. Like, Listen, I'm. I say it. I don't know. I'm the wrong person to like have that discussion. Favorite things you've ever said was in your first clip that we had, and you were like, "Oh my god, God!" <laughs> 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 That's talking in vain. That's what I'm saying. But like, I do that. That's oh, something I you say. He's yours. No, it's because we, if you have reverence for God and by the mind you, I'm imperfect. I'm a sinner. I'm a hypocrite. I'm doing like, okay, I'm not perfect. I'm not a pastor. Mm. Uh, this, I break this one all the time. And the reason why using the Lord's name in vain is uh, sinful and we should repent for it is because it alludes to us having this uh, like casual relationship uh our relationship with our father is not casual there are formalities and if you then say to others who may not be of christ or maybe non-believers if you're constantly being like damn 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 bleep 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 right oh my god oh my god oh my god that entices other people to then say it and think it's okay so you know what i'm saying it's literally just like what happens after even though my intentions may be pure and i'm not you know evil per se and Everyone uses OMG. Everyone that I know. Use, I know some people that are way more devout in the text than I am who still say it. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't perpetuate like uh, loyalty. 
It's mm. and it's disrespectful too. Listen, Wheezy, I still say it, but I'm just saying what the thing says, what the outline says, what the Ten Commandments say. And they say, don't use the Lord's name in vain. I mean, eventually I won't. He probably thinks this part is about him. <laughs> don't, don't you, don't you, don't you. Oh, wow. I love this for us. Sorry, that's bad. I love it. I look like a chola and I sing country. You do look like a chola. I do. You look like a Mexican Dolly Parton. I love it. Okay, anyways. Um, okay, commandment number four. Respect God's day of rest, which we know if we've been reading along is the Sabbath day, the day of rest. Uh, five, respect your parents. Respect your parents. Love you, mom. Love you, dad. Uh, do not kill people. Don't do that. Why? No. If you're stressed, if you're mad, take it out on a on a beanbag, go out for a run, pray on it. Don't kill. Uh, respect marriages. Respect your marriages and respect the marriages of others. Commandment number eight, do not steal. Oh, that's tough. I've stolen before. I have. It's not, not my proudest moment. But What'd I you a, sell? I was really poor. <laughs> I was really poor and I didn't have, I stopped, you know, using my sugar daddy. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, it makes me feel bad. I don't want to do this anymore. So... I sometimes would steal like um, protein bars. I know because I was so hungry and like I was still working out too. And yeah, I know I'm not proud of it. And like I repent, I repent, and I don't hold on to any of that guilt because where did you steal them from? Uh, Whole Foods. <laughs> that made me feel a little better. Fuck you, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> like um, uh, the, I used to steal uh, what do you call them? Perfect bars. Oh, so bad. I, I really do wish that I it's like one of my biggest regrets. And I still think about it sometimes. Have you stolen anything? Uh, I think I stole a juicy couture wallet and they arrested me at a Macy's. <laughs> Why? I don't remember what it was. I was like 12. But I just remember I went I like went to fucking booking. It was bad. And you know, what was crazy. I didn't even understand at the time. I was with one of my girlfriends who's super dark skin and she got slammed on the ground and I didn't. Oh, that's why they hate light skins like all of us. Like <laughs> they hate us. That's why. No, I'm I, kidding. I too hate it. But no, I remember when I that, that happened and when we were uh when we went to like the juvenile shit, my friend had a mark on her face. And the woman that was taking my mugshot was like, What happened to her? And I told them, and she was like, And you both stole. And I remember the way that her and this other cop looked at each other was like, oh, it was intense. They Damn, I don't think I've ever told that story. Can you just keep talking about the command? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, but I put a pin on that because I want to know more that about that. Bad story. Oh, okay. We're talking about that later. Sorry, guys. Oh, maybe for the Patreon bonus content. I don't know. Um, all right. Uh, commandment number nine. Do not lie. Lies make our souls calloused. Not mean. And don't be jealous. Don't covet. Don't covet other people's belongings, other people's wives, other people's possessions. What's the covet mean? To covet, to want to like adopt, to covet, to. That's why you said you can't screw your neighbor's wife. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that was covet. Um, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. You know, this is Bible stories with Brianda, <laughs> but uh, it's basically like don't don't be jealous. You know. It's the kid's version. How would a kid synthesize that information? Probably synthesize that by like, you're not going to tell a kid, like, don't sleep with your friend's wife. You're going to be like, just don't be a jealous dude or girl. By the way, Moses was at the top of Mount Sinai experiencing, you know, God's presence, uh, preparing himself for all the information, being a sponge that he was going to have to then relay to Three million Israelites at the bottom, at the floor of Mount Sinai. So God tells him, after he gave him the commandments, he says, all right, now, because I'm holy, and these people can't just be coming to me like I'm a regular degular, I need to create, build, well, you, Moses, need to build a sanctuary, a holy place, a tabernacle, for uh, God's presence to be 
protected and held for people to then, you know, uh, seek atonement, uh, offer sacrifices. Like it would be a home where the holy and uh, uh, the semi-holy, right? Like, because only high priests could actually go inside the tabernacle. But um, it, it, a place where people can glorify and worship God. Um, now, they were, he was very specific about how this tabernacle was going to look, how this tabernacle was going to be built, who was going to be able to go in, the, de the decor. Like, God is a God of aesthetic, okay? Everything was so specific. Like, even while you're reading that part of Exodus, you're like, oh my gosh, like, how many times are we going to talk about the linen, the curtains? <laughs> like, it was like an episode of HGTV in the Bible. But it was so cool to know that our Father, like, what matters to Him can also, uh, uh, th we matter so much to Him that He wants everything to be done in a specific way. Like, I don't know, like, I haven't been in a relationship in a really long time, but I don't know, Weezy, you know, there's something really attractive about uh, a person who, like, gives really specific gifts and, like, super specific about what they want and what they want for you. Like, that's hot. That Not to say that God is hotter or whatever, but, like, when someone loves you to have that kind of, like, attention to detail... I don't know. It shows me that you really care. Like a dog loving you that much? That's all I can think about. No! Like, I can't think of any other selfless love besides like a dog and like what people say they feel with God. Boyfriends? Anybody? Like, no, I think a dog would probably... <laughs> Someone's going through it. <laughs> anyway, um, so God is super specific about how he wants the tabernacle to look. Let's hop to scripture. So uh, scripture from Exodus 26, verses one through three. Uh, make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple and scarlet yarn with cherubim woven into them by a skilled worker. All the curtains are to be the same size, 28 cubits long and four cubits wide. Join five of the curtains together and do the same with the other five. Like details like that. And the actual tent would be encased within a courtyard that was a little bigger as well. I mean, you guys, once you have a minute, pause the podcast and Google image the Bible tabernacle. The first one, not when Solomon comes in and creates a new tabernacle in Jer Jerusalem. Uh, that's another story for another day. But Google it just so that you can put an image to what I'm saying uh, verbally. Now, in this tabernacle, there was going to be an altar of burnt offerings, a courtyard, which I just said, oil for the lampstand, the oil for anointing things, which is super important, making things holy. Uh, priest garments were supposed to be gold, blue, purple, scarlet yarn. Fabulous. Bougie. OK, consecrate every priest. Only priests would be allowed inside the tabernacle, anointing Aaron and his sons, future Levites. Aaron is, as we remember from previous episode, Moses' brother. Um, there were going to be incense observing on the Sabbath day. Scripture, Exodus 31, verse 14. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it be put to death. Those who work on that day must be cut off from the people. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Okay? Now, all of this information was being relayed to Moses, 40 days, 40 nights. And let me tell you something. This, imagine being the Israelites. Now, we already know them Israelites are trifling from the last episode. They complain, they're grumbling, you know what I'm saying? And they're down here waiting on Moses 40 days and 40 nights while Moses is literally changing humanity. <laughs> no big deal. Like they were so impatient. The Israelites at the bottom, towards the end of the 40th day, uh, uh, they go, okay, he's not coming up. He's not coming back down. He's probably dead. Like, what are we even doing here, you guys? Let's just forget what we promised him about being cleansed and being holy. Let's just start worshiping other things because clearly Moses is gone. Bada bing, bada boom. So the people of Israel 
go to Aaron, who is kind of like the second in command among other people, uh, two other people. There's also Joshua. That's another book. But anyways, um, they go to Aaron and they go, OK, we need to worship something else. We need to build something. So Aaron basically commissions a golden calf to be made. Mind you, mind you, mind you. Moses is still chilling with God up at Mount Sinai while all this th- this mm, F ish is happening at the bottom. Aaron gets a bunch of people to build and put together a golden calf and they start worshiping it because they're helpless. They gave up on God. They lost their faith. They lost their way. And let me tell you something. Moses daps up God and goes, all right, bet. I'm going to go out down there and tell all the people what you just told me. And we're going to get it popping. We're going to build that tabernacle. It's going to be lit. He goes down the mountain holding his stone tablets that were probably heavy. <laughs> and he sees all these people dancing around a golden calf going, ah! Like literally, he just left. You had one job to do, not worship idols, like among other things. To be fair, Tabernacle does sound like a good club name. <laughs> we see. Club. Y'all gonna go to the Tabernacle? Are oh, we going to the Tab? Yes, do a Tab. Oh, oh wow. Ooh. Okay, wait, we gotta talk about this oh later. Oh my God, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, God. Anyways, Moses sees this and he gets heated he's livid in a fury and mind you god knows that this is going down what's happening down there why do you think i bet you that's why god was so spicy and so like had like all the 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 thunder and stuff because he probably saw no he did he knew that those people were going to be doing that but in his own presence that level of disrespect so Once Moses sees this, he gets so pissed. He ends up throwing the stone tablets and they end up breaking in a bunch of pieces. And Moses is like, what are you guys doing? And at this point, Moses is pissed. God is pissed. Let's hop to scripture and tap back into how the Lord is doing. Exodus 32 Uh, Verse 10, now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. God was about to, they know finger snap, like I can end all of this right now. That's how depleted and disappointed our father was at that moment. And God pleads with him. Wait, no, 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 no. After all that we've done, please turn from your fierce anger, relent and do not bring disaster on your people. You know, Moses goes to God and goes, remember the promise, the promise that you made with Abraham, with Isaac, with Israel. Please, please have mercy. Hmm. Then the Lord goes, okay, fine. Scripture, chapter 33, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land I promised to oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, uh, the Hivites and the Jebusites. <laughs> uh, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you because you are a stiff necked people and I might destroy you on the way. That's what the Lord uh, says. Man. (sighs) Well, obviously, we know that God does uh, uh, have mercy on the people after that despicable act. Right. And uh, Moses gets a new set of. stone tablets exactly the way he said it the first time and moses you know enlists in uh, a bunch of those skilled workers to start building the tabernacle and um, designing it this exactly the way god wanted and uh the lord commanded uh for moses to um to get to work exodus 34 Verse six, the Lord, the Lord, 
twice. It says, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. Darn it. So as Moses gets his second set of the, the tablet, you know, Moses bows down and worships. I mean, what are you going to do? That's all you can do when you're in his presence, but especially when you feel the mercy in such a palpable way. So yada, yada, yada. There are four chapters long of the tabernacle being built. And I mean, if I were you, I would go uh, go ahead and read those for yourselves. It goes from chapter uh, 30, I think it's 30, 35 to the end. And um, the last chunk of it, though, Moses had to do. Like inside setting the things up, the furniture where it was going to go, putting the incense here. That was Moses as he was building. Building the tabernacle, I think, took a couple, took like some months under a year. I guess we could look that up. Someone leave me a comment and leave me a comment on the YouTube how long exactly it was. But I couldn't have been more than a year, maybe a year and some change. Um, but this, I, we're going to wind, we're winding down the episode now. Once the tabernacle was built, the ark was put placed because, you know, the, ta the, the stone tablets were placed uh, in a very specific way within this, uh, the tent of meeting, which is also how the tabernacle is referred to. Uh, Moses ordains, uh, gets his brother and his sons ordained to be priests because they are going to be the mediators. You know, this is how we start. This is the beginning of a new kingdom, the kingdom of priests. You know, God shows his presence in the tent and it's something you can feel you see it like a thick cloud god places his presence in the center of the tabernacle that was complete and of course after building something long and hard what does anyone want to do they want to like enjoy it a little bit they want to check it out they want to see what's going on so moses walks up the courtyard and as he's about to go inside the tabernacle, he can't. He physically can't go inside. Let's just read scripture one last time. Chapter 40, verse 35. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I mean, why do we think Moses couldn't go inside. I've talked to three different pastors about this, some of my brothers and sisters in Christ about it, and we all kind of have different reasons, different interpretations. You know, some people say Moses and the Israelites just sinned way too much. You know, God had to draw the line at some point. Like, thank you for building this. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for, you know, being a good shepherd, but this is where I draw the line. You can't go in. Some people say you had to be a high priest to be in there. And Moses wasn't there yet. Some people say maybe it was a way to distinguish between us human people, like the Israelites people and God. Like in that moment where Moses quite physically, literally couldn't enter it's the separation between a being that's holy and always holy and a, a human, a person, a sinful person. We're not the same. And if you're thinking about it metaphorically, it's kind of like that's what that embodies, resembles. But there are many different interpretations. Let me know in the comments what you think uh, it meant that, that Moses couldn't go inside. Because that's how the book ends. It literally ends with, and Moses couldn't go inside. That's how Exodus ends. Okay. I know. But you know what? It leaves you with the question, well, darn it. I feel kind of like 
sad. So how will we ever be able to join God? How will we ever be able to, to be in the same home as him? Will it ever be possible? And that leads us to the next book, Leviticus. But we'll have to wait till next week for that one. Moral of the story is, oh, there are so many things I could have picked as the, you know, the last installment in the story of Moses, right? I could have picked, you know, God is a fighter. God is a God of love and wrath. I, I don't know. Anytime I try and figure out what I want to do for moral of the story, I try and pick like what feeling within me was conjured up while I was either reading or sitting down to write how this episode was going to go. And I've read Exodus a handful of times. And at the end of it, I always get a different moral of the story. And this time, I got a new, a new one. This time, I understood that there's freedom in the unknown. You know, there's so many things that we don't know. And in life, we have tendencies to become anxious by the things we don't know, fear the things we don't know, kill the things we don't know, disrespect the things we don't know. And in this story, in this last chunk of Exodus, there were so many moments where I asked myself, but why? But why? Why did the Israelites uh, uh, betray our father again for like the fifth time? But why? But why did Aaron, Moses' brother, officiate this golden calf? Aaron had met God, had conversations, and he did that anyways. Why? Why? And then another question is, why was it Moses let in? All these whys. And then I realized, oh, we're, we're, we're never going to know everything. And perhaps there can be comfort in that. And maybe it takes practice. Maybe there's freedom in surrender and surrendering the need to know and understanding that it's not our responsibility to know. Hmm. And it's this, I had this weird feeling when I was writing this moral of the story, unlike other ones, I swear. Because for a moment, I use, allowed my, normally I don't like my thinking brain to uh, impede on my like spiritual work because I, if I get too heady, I, I start, you know, getting doubtful and too like just unnecessarily dubious. You know what I'm saying? Um, which I just said doubtful. I just said it twice. After reading this part of Exodus, I understood we are not the same as God. And God is reality. God is perfect. God is the ideal. We are not. We're not that. Moses couldn't go inside. And maybe there's freedom in not knowing why. When Moses couldn't go inside the tent, he was quite actually blocked by God's presence. The opacity, the density of God's presence was too much that he physically could not go inside. And sometimes the dealings of God and apologetics and your will, so much of it doesn't come from here, your mind. It comes from something much deeper, something you can feel. And I guess what I'm saying is sometimes feeling that you don't know can be liberating. Ooh. Hey, Father. Oh, I love you too. He loves you too. 
Yeah, you know, I don't know. I feel like it went okay. Like we got Leviticus next week. I'm sorry, Father. No, she, she she knows that's not how you say Leviticus, Father. Why would you say that, Weezy? 